In this final video on lower respiratory uh, system pathology, we're going to look at uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Uh, that would be emphysema and chronic bronchitis. We'll look at uh, atelectasis, bronchiectasis, and lung cancer. The first order here, bronchiectasis, is an irreversible dilation of the bronchi, and it's caused by destruction of the bronchial uh, muscle, uh, and the smooth muscle in the bronchial wall, and the elastin. Uh, it's relatively uncommon. Um, it, uh, I'll talk about how it used to be common with some common childhood infections. Um, the bronchi often become filled with mucus, and uh, typically this is secondary to a chronic infection. Uh, now, you can have an acute reversible dilation of the bronchi that occurs as a consequence of virus or, or bacterial bronchial uh, uh, pulmonary infection, uh, but then and that takes several months to kind of restore itself, but it eventually returns to the normal baseline. So this is going to be something that doesn't heal. It's actually, again, irreversible. And there's two different types. <clears throat> there's the obstructive bronchiectasis which is localized to a lung segment. So that's one of those tertiary bronchioles and down. Um, this is going to be usually distal to mechanical obstruction of the central bronchus. And uh, that could be from an inhaled foreign body, but typically tumors or chronic mucus plugs and asthma and, and so forth can cause obstructive bronchiectasis. Non-obstructive is going to be usually from a complication from respiratory tract infections. The classic clinical presentation of bronchiectasis is going to be chronic productive cough with loss of sputum, often several hundred milliliters a day. Uh, common hemoptysis, so coughing up blood. Uh, the inflammation actually erodes to the bronchial walls and that ruptures arteries. Uh, uh, shortness of breath, pleuritic chest pains, wheezing, fever, weakness, fatigue, weight loss can also present there. Uh, it can have rare episodic hemoptysis with little to no sputum production. That's called dry bronchiectasis. And then um, usually um, if there is an acute bacterial infection on top of that, like you develop pneumonia, that can have all the classic symptoms of pneumonia, but also increased sputum, increased viscosity of the sputum, foul odor of the sputum, low-grade fever, Increased malaise fatigue, increased shortness of breath, uh, you know, the uh, wheezing and pain. Um, so that is um, kind of the general presentation. Now, usually in the past, the, um, uh, the localized areas of the lung develop bronchiectasis as a result of different childhood infections. So pertussis and measles were common causes in the past, but those have now with immunization programs have diminished. Um, and so now typically we see more like adenoviruses and RSV in children, a more common cause. Um, in more generalized bronchiectasis, this is going to happen more in older patients, usually secondary to an inherited impairment in the host immunity. Uh, bacteria will colonize, they'll initiate chronic inflammation. So that can happen like in cystic fibrosis and so forth. Um, so lots of different causes for bronchiectasis. <clears throat> The assessment is to do the history, classic findings there, again, daily cough with sputum production. Phys physical exam would have pretty nonspecific findings on auscultation, maybe crockles and ronchi, wheezes, inspiratory squeaks. Uh, about 2 to 3% of patients will present with digital clubbing. Um, possible cyanosis um, and polycythemia, that is actually a condition where you... Uh, uh, make too many red cells. And that's to do with the fact that the kidney perceives chronic hypoxia, so it sends out the hormone epopoietin, and that tells the bone marrow to make red blood cells. And so that happens, for example, if you go to a, from a low altitude to a high altitude space, you'll make more red cells. That creates a temporary polycythemia. But in this case, because of the chronic uh, pulmonary disorder, you're going to have a, a more long-term polycythemia. This is not going to be common, but it can be a possibility. Uh, wasting, weight loss, um, core pulmonale might happen as well in more advanced disease, and that is right heart failure, uh, and that has to do with increase of pulmonary blood pressure. The right heart has to push more against the increased pressure in the venous tree in the lungs, and um, so that causes it to enlarge, and that can start going into heart failure. So that's core pulmonale is right heart failure due to lung disease. Uh, sputum analysis, chest x-ray, but probably the gold standard is what's called high-resolution uh, CT scan, HRCT.
So mainstay of treatment is really antibiotics if, if necessary and chest physiotherapy. So doing things to increase the drainage of mucus and the flow of mucus. Uh, sometimes bronchodilators, corticosteroids, vitamin D supplementation seems to have a role uh, in severe disease oxygen, hospitalization for acute exacerbations and possible surgery of different parts of the lung that are maybe becoming too infected and have lost any sort of pulmonary function. So that's bronchiectasis. Again, not common, but important to maybe keep that in mind, uh, especially for older patients who present with this chronic productive cough picture. Now, the most common reason for that is going to be chronic bronchitis, which we'll talk about next, but this could be a component of that. So we're not going to talk about chronic bronchitis just yet. We're going to talk about atelectasis first. So whereas bronchiectasis is a permanent dilation of the bronchus, atelectasis is a collapse um, of a part of the lung. And uh, that can be, uh, some people refer to this as collapsed lung, although that can also happen with a pneumothorax. Remember, that's where you get increased air, increased pressure in that in intrapleural space between the visceral and the parietal pleura, and that can collapse the lungs. Um, but in this case, this has to do with the fact that the um, usually a part of the lung actually collapses, and it's from complete obstruction of a bronchus. And so the lung tissue distal to that obstruction actually collapses. And um, the, in a long-standing atelectasis, the bronchi actually can become fibrotic and remain dilated. So a lot of causes for this would be post-surgically. Uh, TB used to be a big cause of atelectasis. Uh, cigarette smokers are at greater risk. Any sort of obstruction, like from foreign body, but especially tumors, and then having low surfactant. Um, so in this picture down here, you can see, you know, a left, normal left lung, good infiltrate, good air space here, good angle down here at the diaphragm, uh, the heart, good size. But here you just see white. The whole lung is actually collapsed on this side. Um, the, uh, so the, you know, the hilum of the lung is here, so the lung actually collapses around the hilum. Um, so history and physical exam, uh, chest x-ray, uh, chest CT and bronchoscopy might all be uh, uh, assessment tools for that. And the treatment would be aimed at the underlying cause. So physiotherapy, deep breathing, walking, to try to reinflate that lung as much as possible. Uh, continuous positive airway pressure through a face mask. In severe cases, a ventilator might be necessary. Uh, address any obstruction and then any um, potential infection with antibiotics. So again, not common, but uh, important to know when we talk about some of the chronic uh, pulmonary disorders. So much more common than bronchiectasis or atelectasis is chronic bronchitis. Uh, and this is chronic inflammation of the bronchi. And it's different than asthma in that it is considered to be non-reversible. In other words, the changes in the airways are not reversible uh, over time. So it's defined clinically as the presence of a chronic productive cough without discernible cause for at least three months per year in two consecutive years. And um, usually we have this indicates decreased airflow. So we call this chronic obstructive pulmonary disease or COPD. And the two main types of COPD are chronic bronchitis and emphysema. You can think of chronic bronchitis really infect, affects the uh, airways, the bronchi, versus emphysema affects the alveoli. But there's a lot of crossover between the two and that's why they're not distinct entities per se. Um, usually we have an overproduction of mucus and mucins and that blocks the airway. Um, mucins are just the proteins in the mucus. Remember, mucus itself is really just a protein uh, that is linked by disulfide bonds that uh, attracts water, and so it becomes jelly. Uh, so the mucins are the actual um, uh, proteins in there. Another hallmark of chronic bronchitis is goblet cell hyperplasia, so an overproduction of the goblet cells, and then loss of the cilia in the respiratory epithelium, and so that results in loss of the mucociliary clearance um, in the respiratory epithelium. The initial changes are reversible, but with time they become irreversible, so there's again a thickening of the bronchial wall due to mucous gland enlargement, the smooth muscle begins to atrophy, and that eventually results in complete narrowing of the airways and obstruction. Um, so that's the classic findings in uh, chronic bronchitis.
clinically it presents with, um, usually it's accompanied by emphysema as well, and so there's many degrees of severity. But there's a chronic cough, usually it's productive with copious sputum production. I've seen patients with chronic bronchitis actually fill an entire a uh, coffee mug of sputum every morning. It's uh, it's it's a pretty amazing how much mucus uh, the lungs can produce. Cough often is worse in the morning. Uh, the mucus is green, yellow, or orange pink. There might be that some sort of blunt tinge in there, and then wheezing is common. Um, shortness of breath, especially with exertion, and cyanosis can be present. And then there's increased risk for infections like pneumonia. <clears throat> so these patients are at much higher risk for pneumonia. Again, right heart failure, core pulmonale, could develop over time. And what happens with right heart failure, we'll look at this in detail in the cardiovascular block, but the blood all backs up in the venous system. So you start to see distended neck veins. That's called jugular venous distension. You can see uh, the liver becomes enlarged because of portal. Uh, the blood from the liver can't drain into the venous system. And then uh, you get edema in the peripheries. Uh, and a person looks cyanotic overall. They're not hyperventilating. So the classic appearance is what we call the blue bloater. A person actually, these are classic di uh, drawings by a very famous medical illustrator who's passed away now. His name was Netter. He's written a lot of, he, he published a lot of different um, anatomy books and whatnot. Uh, but this is uh, kind of the classic picture of the blue bloater. Person actually looks somewhat cyanotic around the lips uh, and so forth and uh, they're coughing up lots of mucus, lots of sputum. Um, and they really look like they're gasping for breath. Um, so the assessment would be to consider anyone over the age of 35 to 40 who has shortness of breath, chronic cough, sputum production, frequent winter colds, and history of exposure to risk factors. Now with asthma, you're not gonna have the sputum production. Um, but again, there could be somewhat of a crossover, so this is where the spirometry testing can be very helpful. So the spirometry would be our mainstay of testing. Uh, chest x-ray could be helpful. And then there are different uh, severity scales, which I won't go into here, uh, but you can find them online or any uh, guidelines would have that based on the FEV1 readings of spirometry. Possible CT scan would be helpful there too. So in terms of treatment, we can look at chronic versus acute management. Acute would be a management of an acute exacerbation of chronic bronchitis. But chronically, we focus on things like smoking cessation and then medications similar to what's given in asthma. That would be a LABA, long-acting beta agonist, or more typically a LAMA, the long-acting muscarinic antagonist. Remember, the muscarinic receptors are the receptors for acetylcholine, and so that blocks the effects of sympathetics in the lungs. Uh, and then together with an inhaled cortical steroid. But the acute exacerbations, usually oxygen is given, uh, cough suppressants, uh, different bronchodilators, again, usually a nebulizer of a saba, um, antibiotics if there's infection, maybe oral, oral cortical steroids, and there's a role for theophylline as an anti-inflammatory bronchodilator here. So uh, that's chronic bronchitis. Um, I have a number of patients who suffer from this. The, I should, forgot to mention, in terms of causes, the most common cause is tobacco smoking. Uh, over 90% of patients with chronic bronchitis have a history of tobacco smoking. Um, however, I do have a couple of patients who never smoked at all, were never exposed to secondhand smoke, but we think they actually got it from occupations that they worked in. Uh, so coal miners um, are more susceptible, coal miner lung. Uh, but also uh, grain handlers and things like that are more susceptible to developing chronic bronchitis. So any chronic inhalation of air, pollution, fumes, or dust. And in some of the larger cities in the world, um, I was uh, just in Cairo not too long ago, and uh, the air pollution is just horrid. And to actually be breathing that every day for not just days or weeks, but years, decades, um, you know, this is going to create definite particulate stress in the lungs and can set up all sorts of inflammatory processes, but that might predispose one to chronic bronchitis. Now the other polarity here in COPD would be emphysema, and that is an enlargement of the air spaces distal to the terminal bronchioles, so in the respiratory zones. Um, and what happens is the elastin that normally keeps the alveoli in that nice puckered shape that looks like a ball of grapes, uh, the elastin becomes destroyed. And this is uh, more typical, like the chronic bronchitis in older patients, usually over 60. Uh, 
um, there is marked chronic inflammation in the lung, um, and there's increased specifically neutrophils that accumulate in the lungs, and they have an enzyme called elastase, which, as you can imagine, breaks down elastin and that causes destruction of the alveoli, and then you get fibrosis on top of that, which is collagen deposition, and the lungs become overinflated and enlarged. Um, the surface area actually decreases in the alveolar spaces, but they start to, the alveoli begin to enlarge. Um, normally, elastase is inhibited by another enzyme. It's called alpha-1 antitrypsin, alpha-1 uh, alpha AT. Uh, this is a glycoprotein normally produced by the liver. Very interesting how the liver sends out this protein to protect the lungs and any other tissue in the body from elastase. Uh, so this is a major inhibitor of proteases like elastase. Um, unfortunately, some people have a genetic deficiency where they have a, a mutated copy of the gene for alpha-1 antitrypsin. And uh, this is people who at a very young age might actually develop emphysema. So they, even if they're not smokers, maybe they're exposed to other inhalants or whatnot, um, they can develop emphysema from that. Uh, smoking would of course accelerate the damage. So if we look at the causes, tobacco smoking is the cause in over 90% of cases for emphysema. But again, alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency accounts for much of the rest. Uh, chronic inhalation of air pollution again, and then the occupational inhalation. Inhalation and the big one there would be biomass fuel cooking. So uh, that's uh, in a lot of third world countries. That's a typical way with uh, cooking fires and these huts that are just filled with the smoke all day, and um, so very not uncommon uh, in those areas to see an, an increase in emphysema uh, from that. Um, there are several different types of emphysema depending on um, where the destruction is happening. So there's what's called centrilobular emphysema. That's the one most commonly associated with uh, smoking. Panacenar has a different kind of morphology to it in the alveolar space. And then localized emphysema, you know, it used to be called paraseptal emphysema. Not as important here for our purposes, but it can, that's important in terms of um, staging the severity and so forth of uh, the emphysema for treatment. Uh, the clinical presentation, again, could be mixed with chronic bronchitis, but typically, again, chronic cough, uh, more non-productive, minimal uh, sputum, things like that. Wheezing is more common. Uh, dyspnea, worse with exertion, increased use of accessory muscles, and here we see a real what we call barrel chest. People are really using those muscles. They actually get very fine, finely developed musculature on their chest from overuse of those muscles. Uh, Hyper-resonant sounds on auscultation. Cyanosis is not present. In fact, the respiratory rate is usually increased, and these patients are sometimes labeled as pink puffers. Um, so here is the netter drawing of a pink puffer. So see the uh, no, no cyanosis, more red in cheeks, thin, much more thinner than the chronic bronchitis patient, and then uh, very uh, developed accessory muscles um, that they've been using for breathing. Um, and uh, usually this doesn't have other infections. And interestingly, this, unlike the chronic bronchitis, uh, it's not correlated with the core pulmonale, the right heart failure. So that's why the classic blue bloater cyanosis with edema is not as present here. Um, so again, there can be some mixture with chronic bronchitis. So there's, you can think of these as two polar opposite ends and a lot of patients kind of fall in between somewhere in that spectrum. So the assessment is history and physical exam. Uh, we're going to look at things like the CBC and check the hematocrit to see that's the amount of red cells again, see if that's increased. Uh, arterial blood glass gases are sometimes taken from the radial artery to check the concentrations of oxygen and CO2 in the blood. Not typically done uh, except in specialized settings. Definitely going to do a pulse ox and then looking, maybe measuring serum uh, alpha-1 antitrypsin, there's a blood test for that, you can see if maybe there's that genetic deficiency, and then potentially sputum evaluation. Other tests would be, again, the spirometry to help in diagnosis, chest x-ray showing evidence of hyperinflation, and then the high-resolution CT, usually that's not done, but that would give us a, a better, a more clear picture. Um, and then the staging, again, based on FEV1, could be stage 1 through 4, 
um, and that can give us an indication of severity. So treatment would be, again, anticholinergics, bronchodilators, um, again, they're both in the same category, uh, steroids, uh, inhaled or oral, supplemental oxygen, but ultimately the end might be a lung transplant. So usually there's a gradual decline in respiration with increasing shortness of breath. And uh, this is considered, like the chronic bronchitis, to actually be an irreversible degenerative condition. Now, there's a lot, I think, that could be done to stabilize a person so that the degeneration doesn't proceed further. Uh, but in terms of reversing, getting back to normal lung function, that has not happened yet. So that's something that uh, we always hope that there, there's some healing capacity there. But the problem with the scar tissue is once that's laid down, we really have very little that can undo that in internal organs. Um, so typically we work at, again, I, I work chronically looking at the neuroendocrine balance, looking at the adrenal steroids, thyroid function, the digestive function, so giving all the optimal organ support, and, uh, and hopefully that will help stabilize that patient over time. Okay, finally here we'll come to lung cancer. Now, I could, you know, put a note in there about the interstitial lung diseases. Um, I'm not going to talk about them at length here, but that's something you might want to look up. But that would be, for example, the coal miner's lung, um, the asbestosis, silicosis, those kinds of things. And they cause chronic stiffening uh, and pulmonary fibrosis. And those also are thought to be kind of irreversible chronic conditions that kind of deteriorate over time. Um, so there's actually a form of pulmonary fibrosis called idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. We're not sure where it comes from. And I've had a couple of patients with that. And, uh, you know, that unfortunately has a very poor prognosis. Usually by the time of diagnosis, the five-year prognosis after diagnosis is uh, quite low. Um, and we don't really have any medical therapies. It was thought that using corticosteroids and whatnot could help slow that down, but that hasn't panned out. So currently there aren't any real medical therapies. So here, potential novel herbal therapies, uh, maybe working with acupuncture, whatnot. Uh, we have seen benefits in some of those uh, 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 pulmonary fibrosis patients. In fact, uh, one of my students actually wrote a paper on the patient we had worked with together with uh, acupuncture. Um, and uh, had really uh, extended his life much further past, you know, the point where it was thought that he wouldn't uh, live beyond. Um, so there's always hope that we can offer with uh, these other kinds of therapies. Um, but the last condition I want to kind of focus on here is lung cancer. And uh, so this would be, um, we have really two different types of lung cancers. Uh, primary and secondary. The most common uh, lung cancers are actually secondary, meaning they actually come from another tumor. And that the most common sites would be breast, colon, prostate, and bladder. So breast, colon, prostate, bladder. Uh, those tumors metastasize and they end up in the lungs. So that's called a secondary lung cancer. So if you actually biopsy that cancer, you'd see those are prostate cells or breast cancer cells and not lung cells. Primary lung cancers are less common. They originate in the lung. Uh, again, a carcinoma is a uh, tumor that originates in epithelium versus a sarcoma originates in connective tissue. Um, so we're going to be talking about carcinomas here. If it's an adenocarcinoma, it originates in glandular epithelium. Uh, so those are some technical terms we use to differentiate the different types of cancers. Um, this is, in the U.S., the leading cause of cancer death, uh, still, lung cancer. The rates are coming down. The number one cause for lung cancer is cigarette smoking. Um, so we saw for a while, you know, cigarette smoking really uh, kind of upticked up until the 1970s, 80s. Then it kind of went down. Um, and uh, we're now seeing the cancer rates kind of follow a couple decades later, that decrease of smoking. But now we're actually seeing a bit of an uptick again and uh, especially among younger smokers, and so this could actually push the rates back up in the future. Um, the majority, over 85%, are due to long-term tobacco. That said, I've had a couple of lung cancer patients never smoked, and again, no exposure to uh, cigarette smoking, but we think it was maybe occupational in their cases. 10% um, of patients have no symptoms of presentation, and 
the tumor is found incidentally on chest x-ray. Uh, this happened recently to a patient where we uh, did an x-ray of her shoulder for uh, a musculoskeletal issue and found a uh, uh, suspicious lesion on the lungs, did further workup, turns out it's lung cancer. Um, so, but the majority of patients will present at some point at least with um, some of the classic signs of cancer. So cough, often nondescript cough is our first kind of respiratory symptom. Um, and maybe homoptosis, wheezing, shortness of breath. And then our systemic symptoms of weight loss, weakness, fever, fingernail clubbing. This is going to be more longer term uh, development. And then uh, another thing that can happen is as the cancer mass grows, it starts to press on adjacent structures and that can cause chest pain, bone pain, difficulty swallowing. Uh, that can also cause hoarseness by compressing the recurrent laryngeal nerve or it can compress sympathetic nerves in the neck and uh, that can actually cause something called Horner syndrome which causes eyelid drooping. Uh, it also causes a lack of uh, sweating on one side of the face. And, um, and that's due to compression, loss of the sympathetic tone to that area. Uh, so these are all uh, potential effects of lung cancers as they grow. Um, the uh, common sites of metastases from lung cancer um, would be, so this is not from secondary or primary going to the lung, this is from lung going elsewhere. So from the lung, it would spread to the adrenals, the bone, the brain, the bone, pericardium, the liver, that would cause jaundice and hepatomegaly and kidney. So this is where lung tumors can spread too. No screening tests available and routine chest x-rays are not performed except in high risk patients because we don't want to overexpose patients to radiation if we don't have to. Uh, overall, unfortunately, the prognosis for all types of lung cancer is poor. The average is about 16.8% survive for at least five years after diagnosis. Again, just want to point out these are general numbers. There are, of course, outliers in all these cases, and we always want to shoot for the outliers if we can. Um, but this kind of gives us sort of an idea about what we might expect and maybe you know, how aggressive we want to be with treatment and things like that. Um, the causes, again, the majority is smoking or secondhand smoke. Uh, we do know radon exposure. This is why there's such concern about radon gas accumulating in basements and things like that. People breathing it chronically can lead to lung cancer. Uh, asbestos, again, we usually associate that with mesothelioma, which we find in the pleura, uh, but it can uh, cause lung cancer as well. Air pollution, family history and genetics, and then exposure to toxic gases, metals. Big concern now about vaping pens, those high metals are high temperatures are volatilizing the metals in the pen. What is that doing? Where are those metals going? What might that create 20, 30 years or more down the road? Big questions we have right now. Um, some of the com complications I mentioned already, some of them. So a pancos tumor is a tumor in the lung apex. Remember the apex is the upper part of the, the upper little conical part of the lung that protrudes above the first rib. Um, and those tumors can invade uh, part of the sympathetic nervous system, and that can lead to Horner syndrome, which is um, having uh, eyelid drooping, ptosis, uh, meiosis, which is actually constriction of the eyes, of the uh, pupil, and then anhydrosis, lack of sweating. So on that side of the face, uh, that eye would droop, the pupil would be constricted, and you'd have no sweating. Um, superior vena cava syndrome uh, would be obstruction of the superior vena cava. That is the vein that drains essentially all of your upper, uh, the neck and the head, all the venous blood from there. And uh, that would involve block blood drainage from the brain. That would be a medical emergency. And then compression of the recurrent laryngeal nerve that can cause the chronic hoarseness like we talked about. Um, there, some of the tumors actually uh, secrete hormones and this creates what's called perineoplastic syndrome. So this would be tumors from specific neuroendocrine cells. And so we'll, I'll talk about all the different types of primary lung cancers here in just a moment. Uh, but some of them can secrete parathyroid hormone and that can raise your blood calcium levels. That can also erode the bones because all the calcium is coming out of your bones. Um, increase ADH, antidiuretic hormone, which can cause something 
called syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone that causes uh, water retention, but that also suppresses your sodium levels. You get what's called hyponatremia from that, and that can have all sorts of neurological consequences. Um, increased ACTH can cause Cushing syndrome, that's increased cortisol. So these are normally hormones that are secreted by your, um, in the, the case of these last two, your pituitary. Uh, parathyroid comes from your thyroid, but these can be over-secreted in certain neuroendocrine lung cancers. And then Lambert-Eaton's myasthenic syndrome is uh, muscle weakness due to an antibodies to um, a special calcium channel. Um, so that can also uh, occur in uh, these perineoplastic lung cancers. So um, this is uh, called perineoplastic syndrome. Again, PANCOS tumor, perineoplastic syndrome can be complications of lung cancers. The last one would be having pleural or pericardial effusion, which has built up a fluid in the pleural or pericardial space. And that of course would compress the lungs, potentially causing lung collapse, making it difficult to breathe, or compress the heart, causing something called pericardial tamponade. We'll talk about that in the cardiovascular system. So these would all be potential complications of lung cancer. So lung cancers are classified on by the type of cell that's uh, overgrowing. So we can classify them generally as what's called small cell or non-small cell. Um, and we stage them based on what's called the TNM, uh, tumor node metastasis staging system. This is a very common staging system for a lot of different cancers. Um, so let's start with small cell lung cancers. So small cell, or it's also called oat cell carcinoma, uh, usually affects the larger airways, primary and secondary bronchi. It's uh, undifferentiated, and undifferentiated cells mean that they are more like stem cells, they are very aggressive. And um, so this one's associated with the perineoplastic syndromes, the increased ACTH, ADH, the Lambert-Eaton syndrome, perineoplastic uh, encephalitis. And then 60 to 70 percent actually have extensive disease at the time of presentation. So it has already uh, metastasized and grown to such a degree that it's usually incurable. And it's usually inoperable and it's treated with chemotherapy. Uh, so this is really a neoplasm of those uh, Kolchitsky cells. Remember, those are the neuroendocrine cells found, they're pretty rare, less than 1% of the cells in your respiratory epithelium. Um, so they're small, dark blue cells under staining under the microscope. So those are oat cell carcinomas. And um, if you look at the picture up here, that's you know maybe a quarter or so, a little bit less of your um, uh, lung cancers. Now, non-small cell uh, primary lung cancer, we have adenocarcinoma. This is the most common lung cancer, uh, 40%. Um, and this is um, in, found often in non-smokers. And um, it basically, it, uh, there are different mutations we know. Uh, we, we see in these patients often a significant degree of fingernail cl uh, finger clubbing. Uh, we call that hypertrophic osteoarthropathy. That could be very painful, actually, uh, in the digits. There is a subtype of this called the bronchial alveolar subtype, uh, or adenocarcinoma in situ. When you see the word in situ, that means it's isolated, it's in one place. Usually it has not perforated through the basement membrane of the epithelium. And uh, so often these cancers have a very good prognosis because they can be removed and treated, there's no metastases. This one's more common in female, what we call never smokers, they never smoked. Uh, and the chest x-ray often shows a hazy infiltrate, looks like pneumonia. Uh, this one has a very good prognosis. Um, squamous cell carcinoma, the location is more, again, the central lungs. This accounts for 30% of lung, primary lung cancers. Typically occurs close to large airways. Um, we get the cavitations and uh, necrotic areas of cell death uh, at the center of the tumor. And this one can actually uh, produce a hormone that mimics parathyroid hormone, which increases your calcium levels. It's called PTHRP. Uh, so that's squamous cell carcinoma. And then we have large cell carcinoma. That's about 9% of lung cancers. These are highly uh, undifferentiated tumors. Again, very aggressive. 
very large cells with excess cytoplasm, poor prognosis, very poor response to chemotherapy, and they could be removed to some degree with, uh, surgically. And then bronchial, bronchial carcinoid tumors, these have a good prognosis. Metastases are rare. Carcinoid is a tumor of a neuroendocrine cell um, that over, and these cells secrete serotonin specifically. So excess serotonin actually gives you flushing, diarrhea, and wheezing because it constricts the airways. Um, so those would be some of the symptoms of a bronchial carcinoid tumor. So when people say they have a lung cancer, so a patient comes in and says, I have lung cancer, it's important to know which type of lung cancer do you have, and um, if they know, and then what is the uh, stage of the lung cancer. So I'm not gonna go into the whole staging system here with lung cancers because it's gonna be too far beyond what we can talk about. But basically, um, this can tell you a little bit about maybe what their prognosis might be long-term. You know, again, if they have a small cell, oat cell carcinoma, very different than having the bronchial alveolar subtype of adenocarcinoma. And so that could uh, maybe help you uh, think about your therapies a little bit more. So that's a little overview of the basic types of lung cancer. Now the basic assessment for lung cancer is gonna be with chest X-ray. Uh, again, CT scan is gonna give a more uh, detailed view and then usually a combination of bronchoscopy with CT guided biopsy could help take a biopsy of that area. Um, but the chest X-ray and the CT would reveal the tumor, of course, any widening of the mediastinum, which would suggest lymph node metastases, um, atelectasis, remember that's that portion of the collapsed lung due to the, due to the tumor obstructing a tertiary bronchus or lower. Um, consolidation from pneumonia or pleural effusion would all be detectable on the imaging. And then the staging, here is the staging system. I've just uh, put a little copy of this for your information to the right here. Uh, but basically, we uh, uh, patients will be given a T score. So that's going to be basically the size of the tumor and where it's located. So that goes from T0 to T4. <clears throat> and you can read about the size and kind of where it's located there. Uh, and then another score based on their lymph nodes. So N0 would mean no regional lymph node metastases. N3 would mean that there are metastases that have pretty much spread all around uh, the lung area and so forth. And then uh, distal metastases would be M0. No metastases to M1B would be there's distal metastases. So a patient might have a score of T3, you know, N3, M1B, that's gonna be a very poor potential prognosis versus a patient that had maybe a T1, N0, M0 score. And so that's where uh, knowing that could be helpful and patients won't always know that, but they might bring in their paperwork from the oncologist, which you can look over and that might tell you a little bit more about that. <clears throat> so the treatment really, again, I'm not gonna go into that, that's a whole, discussion about all the current agents that are used for the different types of uh, primary lung cancers, but really depends on the specific cell type, the stage, and the presence of metastases. So common treatments sort of for most cancers would be surgery, but a lot of these lung tumors, especially in later stages, are not surgically resectable. Uh, chemotherapy, radiation, uh, more and more we're seeing targeted immuno immunotherapy where a patient's tumor cells are uh, removed um, and they actually are, they train a person's white blood cells to actually attack those uh, tumor cells, specifically re-inject those cells into the body and then hope for an immune response against the tumor. So that's what we're calling targeted immunotherapy. I don't know of that being applied to any of the primary lung cancers yet, um, but that might be something coming. Um, I think it's interesting that in a lot of traditional medicines, for example, anthroposophic medicine, um, they focus on things like mistletoe therapy <clears throat> injected. And the, the rationale is the mistletoe is actually trying to induce an acute inflammatory response, i.e. upregulate the immune response, uh, to directly attack the tumors. And um, so there's uh, been a lot of actually published data on mistletoe, and we do see that it has a tremendous benefit of actually improving the quality of life for stage four cancer patients. These are patients with distal metastases. Uh, 
some benefits on some cancers of actually extending lifespan and decreasing tumor size. Um, but there's no magic cure that has popped up yet. But I think a combination of those kind of therapies really is promising. And um, so this is, I think, as we're hopefully going to leave the era of chemotherapy behind in the coming decades, <clears throat> we're going to see maybe a return of therapies that emphasize supporting the immune response. And that can involve a lot of herbal therapies and so forth that we haven't really explored yet. But keeping the patient warm, <clears throat> uh, encouraging their internal warmth, and that's not just physically, but also psychologically and spiritually in terms of getting them excited about life and their, their uh, sort of mission in life and, and what their purpose is and so forth. All of those are important aspects of what I might call warmth cultivation. And again, from the perspective of Chinese medicine, we could say that that's really therapies that encourage the Shen and that really engage the spiritual forces. And that's really what cancer in a way is, is where those Shen warmth forces, immune forces, have removed themselves from an area of cells that are overgrowing. These are not foreign cells. These are your own cells, but they're no longer being kept in line by the immune forces. And we can think of the Shen as working through that. So any therapy that could be used to encourage that could be potentially beneficial uh, for the cancer patients. Unfortunately, the prognosis is currently very poor for uh, the lung cancers. The pool data, again, suggests a five-year survival rate of between 9.5% to 16.8%. Um, again, this depends on the stage. So if we look at the small cell carcinomas, they have a much poorer prognosis, and especially in the later stages. So stage four, small cell lung carcinoma, carcinoma has a five-year survival rate of less than 1% versus the non-small cell lung cancers, better survival rate, again, better with the lower stages. Um, so um, a lot of patients are unfortunately beyond the ability of surgery or chemotherapy, current medical methods uh, for treatment, and so they're given palliative care. Uh, and so that's the other treatment option there. Okay, so that wraps it up for diseases and disorders of the respiratory system. Uh, so be sure you're familiar with all the major upper and lower respiratory disorders we discussed. Know a little bit about kind of what the assessments are. Or first of all, the clinical presentations, but also the assessments and then the basic biomedical treatments. And then you can add to that your treatments, depending on the therapeutic order, the other treatments with acupuncture, herbal therapy, nutrition, and so forth that you learn along the way.